Good morning. Welcome to the gathering of people we call Pase Panjang Christ Church. This morning, my heart is glad because we have some of our church family that have no access, no easy access to our live stream that we have been able to welcome back to worship together with us. For those of us that can easily live stream, we will wait a little while longer. Our priority is to allow all of our people to worship together. Today is the start of our Missions and Evangelism Month. Many of you have already messaged me during the week, thinking through how good God has been in His providence, allowing us to go through Romans this year. You have commented on how appropriate the passages of Scripture from Romans have really been applicable to our hearts and our minds during this COVID-19 challenging season. We have gone from Romans chapter 1 to chapter 8. We have reached the heights of the midpoint peak, that very great height where we declare, and we declare together as a church as we read, nothing separates us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. From that very high peak, where do we go from there? Paul goes immediately from the relationship of love, that vertical relationship with his Heavenly Father, to thoughts about his horizontal relationship with others. His thoughts turn immediately to his own people, the Israelites. Paul was a Jew. And he says with great passion in his heart, I wish, I wish that they would also believe in Jesus Christ. The gospel gives us passion. The gospel gives us passion. Paul says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And last week, our speaker raised this question. The question was, when have you felt that same level of emotion as you thought about those who are still cut off from Christ? What are you passionate about? Who are you passionate about? Yesterday, we had the incumbent team for our constituency visit us at our front door. It is election season. Some of you have probably not seen your members of parliament for a while, but this time around, you will see them. I had a minister come and present with both hands, asking for support. A passionate plea for your vote. As Christians, we have far greater reason to be passionate for the gospel. We are not just simply asking to determine the future of Singapore for the next five years. Who will be in government? Who will represent us? The gospel has impact for all of eternity. The gospel has blessings of eternal proportions. The gospel gives us passion. And then the gospel leads us to prayer. Paul says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. And we pray, don't we? We pray. Many of you have prayed for your unsaved loved ones, your parents, your children, your brothers and sisters. Many of you have labored in prayer, and we did last week as a church in our day of prayer. We pray because gospel passion leads us to prayer. And as we pray, there's a progression in the text that gives us comfort 
the comfort as we think of those who are yet cut off, who, are, who have not come to believe. Paul tells us, I want you to receive this comfort. We have a sovereign God who knows what He is doing. God has a plan of salvation. He's not some clueless God who's just asking you, hey, please vote for me, please vote for me. He's not that just clueless God hoping that people will buy a product that He sells. No, this is the sovereign God, the God of all creation, a righteous God of justice and mercy. The gospel is about God's righteousness, not only in the salvific, salvific act of Jesus Christ, but also in his plan of how he executes that sovereign plan to save his people from their sin. Right here in chapters 9 to 11, Paul highlights that the gospel is God's righteousness demonstrated in his sovereign plan. This is the outline I gave to you, showing the overview right from day one. Chapters 1 to 4 show us that the gospel is God's righteousness revealed in justification by faith alone. We are declared righteous by faith alone. Chapters 5 to 8 tell us about God's righteousness that by faith brings blessings, peace with God, grace, hope, love. Now we turn to the very big question of how God is going to execute this salvation plan to all. The gospel is about how we as individuals come to a relationship by faith with God, but the gospel is also about how God executes His sovereign plan to save. Paul describes in chapters 9 to 11 how the Jews and the Gentiles, they both feature in God's sovereign plan. We all have our place. There's a commentator and he put it very well. Salvation is not by race. Salvation is by grace. Not grace. Not race. But grace. The grace of God that reaches to us. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says it is the power of God to save all who believe. And then he addresses salvation history, the Jew first and also the Greek. And so he now has to deal with the continuation or the continuity of salvation history. In these three chapters, he addresses this issue right head on. In the Old Testament scriptures, God made a promise to Israel, his chosen people. He says, I will be your God and you will be my people. But now, in the New Testament church at Rome, Paul looks at the situation in the early church and the truth is that very few Jews are coming to Christ. The church is becoming an increasingly Gentile place. Did God somehow fail to keep his word? He did promise the Jews are his chosen people. Paul begins the passage today with the answer. It is not as though the word of God has failed. God always keeps his promises. Nothing will get in the way of God drawing his people to himself because God always keeps his promises. And so in chapters 9 to 11, Paul addresses this question. Who is true Israel? Four sections 
take us through God's sovereignty, man's accountability, the reality of the remnant that believes of physical Israel, and the plan that God will save all Israel. I had the privilege of going through these sections with you in greater detail. But today, I want to deal with a very troubling topic for some. God's sovereignty and man's accountability. This is a huge area of debate. Okay, this is huge. Now listen. I wanted you to be sure to have the right frame of mind upon which to read chapters 9 to 11. Already this week, because we have started reading chapter 9, some of our people are struggling through this passage. The major question received is this. If God chooses, is he unfair? You know, we read this, God chose Isaac over Ishmael in the line of promise. God chose Jacob over Esau in the line of promise. I mean, it was said to the mother, Rebecca, the elder shall serve the younger. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. We read this and we almost say, how dare you, God? How dare you? Before they were born, how could you choose Jacob to carry on the line of promise before you even see what they did? You should see what they do first, right? Then you decide, correct? Isn't that fair? How can you unconditionally choose? As if that's not enough. Paul goes on to write, Hey, you know, God chose to deliver Israel from Egypt, and I want you to note Pharaoh's role. He describes it. He says, Therefore, have he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. And that reference to harden really harks back to the book of Exodus. Because when Pharaoh hardened his heart and says, I will not let God's people go, I will not let the people go, the text of Exodus tells us God hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people go all the way until the tenth plague. All the way until the angel of death passed over, firstborn killed. Then, Pharaoh let God's people go. We say, it is good that God chose to deliver Israel. I mean, after all, they were slaves to Egypt and God had promised. He had promised salvation through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But Paul sticks in this comment. He will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and he hardens whom he wills. Why does Paul say this? God put Pharaoh there. Everyone thinks during that time where the Egyptians were really the world power, that Pharaoh was the supreme king, right? He was the supreme emperor, Pharaoh, they called him. Paul is trying to tell us God is sovereign. Everyone thinks Pharaoh is the king. He's the most important. But Exodus records that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so Pharaoh rejected, 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 plague after plague after plague. And we read this and just say, God, why like that? Why you harden Pharaoh's heart? Fair Lord. I mean, it's bad enough he hardened his own heart, right? Couldn't you give him another chance? God, why do you get to choose who to save and who to reject? This is a very typical question. A typical response coming from the human perspective, God, I almost feel you're unfair. How come you choose without giving them a chance? And the sovereignty of God, especially in the era of salvation, evokes a very passionate response, you know, because deep within us, in our hearts and minds, we almost disagree. From our perspective, it seems legitimate object. The reality 
is that this deep-seated passionate response comes from the perspective of the human. You say, Pastor, what, what do you mean? You see, our perspective and our decisions change when the information that we understand changes. Is it the plan for Singapore to have 10 million people? Or any number for that matter? Well, if I think the answer is yes, I respond one way. If I know the answer is no, I respond another way. My response is based on the information I have. Earlier this week, I picked one of my sons from school. I waited almost half an hour for him. And, you know, I started to think, hey, what happened? Not very fair, eh? I have to wait, you know. When he, when he arrived, he said, hey, Dad, I'm so sorry. There's this teacher, I don't know why, kept us back for the whole time. Immediately, my heart corrected itself. Based on the information I received, I said, yep, it's, it's not my son's fault. It's probably unfair for him too. What changed? What was the difference? Information. Imperfect information leads us to the wrong conclusions because our perspective is determined by information. As more information is given to us, we tend to correct our perspective and adjust our decisions. We read in Genesis a little more about Esau. Some information is given to us in the chapters that come. We see a guy who rejected his birthright for food. He despised his birthright. That's what is spoken of. He said, okay, I got a little more information. So let me ask you this question. Who has perfect information? You or God? Do you know Esau better or does God know Esau better? Do you know Jacob better or does God know Jacob better? Was Pharaoh a good person? No, he wasn't. Who knows him better? You or God? Let me assure you, brothers and sisters, when you reach this logical conclusion that God is infinitely all-knowing, He is omniscient. If not, He cannot be God. He always knows what He is doing because He has perfect information. The fact that He decides before anything we see happens doesn't take away anything from his perfection. He knows the end from the beginning. And so, the moment we see from that perspective, quite apart from our own, because we only see single-dimensionally, we realize that our perspective about God changes based on His attributes, who He is. If I tell you God is unfair, then we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be here because we shouldn't worship an unfair God. If I tell you God is not loving, let's not come. If I tell you God is someone who is really, really very, very evil, then why are you here? The reality is by definition, God is perfect, and that's what His Word says. His word tells us his attributes of perfection. Therefore, the sovereign creator who knows the end from the beginning knows the heart of every man, even before he does anything. So as the songwriter says, God, the uncreated one, the author of salvation, wrote the laws of space and time and fashioned worlds to his design the one whom angel hosts revere hung the stars like chandeliers, numbered every grain of sand, knows the heart of every man. And so Paul comes to this question, 
what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? No way, God forbid. It would only be the limit of our knowledge that affects that perception that God is unfair. The truth is that God is sovereign always and He gets to decide. If not, why should He be God? We have no capacity to judge God because God is perfectly omniscient, merciful and fair, and we are not. You and I, as human beings, we live in a single-dimensional plane. I mean, I can't be at two places at the same time, yeah? Can you? I live in the present. I don't live in the future. Neither do I live in the past. God is not limited like us. The one who can exist through time, above time, in time. The multidimensional God. Only Jesus, as God can say, before Abraham was, I am. That is quintessential truth, that God is self-existent. If not, he would not be God. By definition, God is perfectly all-knowing, merciful, and fair. And that is true even if you and I don't understand some of his decisions or what he does, purely because we don't have the information or the capacity. This is the only logical view. If we are intellectually honest, whether you are a believer or not, you realize that we have limitations. Progress itself indicates that we come from a base that is lower, and therefore we are not perfect. We all come to the end of our logic and the end of our ability to see and to know, and we realize that we have to live by faith. You do this in everyday life. I do this in everyday life. I cannot see all that goes on, but I believe and therefore I decide. Nobody in his right mind will say that man is completely perfect, that man can do everything. The truth is that COVID-19 is here, people are dying, there is no vaccine. We are limited. We may come to a vaccine, we pray so, but the fact that we have no vaccine right now demonstrates that we come from a limited base. And so the only logical conclusion is that we have no capacity in our dimension to judge a God who is perfect, who exists in multiple dimensions, far greater than us. Guess what? You only need an opposition party when you have an imperfect God. But because God, by definition, is perfect, just because we are not, doesn't give us the right to accuse him of being unfair. That's exactly what Paul says. He says, no, but O oh man, who are you that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me thus? Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honour and another unto dishonour? And you say, Pastor, what is this vessel unto honour and vessel unto dishonour? Well, here are two vessels that have been made. On the right, cups and a beautiful clay pot. You can drink tea out of that. On the left is also a pot, but a very different pot, a chamber pot. It doesn't hold tea. It functions as a spittoon. People spit into it. And a chamber pot is traditionally known as a toilet. Both pots have their uses. And the point is, the clay from which the pots are made cannot complain to the creator, why do you make me a chamber pot? Huh? Why do you never make me the teapot? Why can't the clay complain? because he or she or it. When you refer to clay, it must be it. When it refers to us, it must be he or she. Because we have different capacities. We exist in a different dimension. 
God is going to make the perfect decision. The only way you are going to go around this logic, the only way you are going to go around this logic is to conclude like the fool, there is no God. There is no other alternative. God is sovereign always. God decides. We have no capacity to judge God because God is perfectly omniscient, merciful and fair, and we are not. God does have a plan. He does have a purpose. Why are we so suspicious of Him? His decision is motivated by love and mercy. Hey, brothers and sisters, the reality is that all sinners should perish, and we all have sinned. God's plan is not to punish, God's plan is to save. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh up to God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. All of us are sinners. All of us should go to hell. But what if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known and endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He hath before prepared unto glory, even us, whom He hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Oh, God has a plan of mercy. He even puts up with great long-suffering those who reject Him. I mean, why doesn't God just end it now? Why doesn't He just kill the wicked? End it right now. Because God is a merciful God. And those of us who are believed, who are the call according to His purpose, even us Gentiles, He is making known the riches of His glory to us waiting for us to respond to Him in faith. God is extending mercy. And so we should not be suspicious of this merciful God. Because God is sovereign always. He gets to decide and we have no capacity to judge God. God is perfectly omniscient, merciful and fair. And we are not. And so the typical response to this is, okay, that's logical. Different dimension. Well, that means if God decides, I don't have a choice, right? If God chooses, I don't choose. This is the typical binary viewpoint. Either God decides or man decides. In our single dimension, it can't be both. You know, either I'm totally in control and I decide, or, well, I got no control, you decide. Lah. Let me explain to you why this is a false dichotomy. That doesn't even work in our human experience. I said, Pastor, what, what do you mean? I, I have two illustrations. They're very imperfect illustrations, so you must bear with me. There is no perfect illustration of how God interacts with man. But here are two human illustrations that allow us to understand that this dichotomy doesn't quite work. That if I insist that I decide, no one else gets to decide. First, husbands and wives. Who makes decisions? Now, don't answer that question, even if you're live stream at home. But does one party make every single decision all the time? Well, I don't think so. I mean, one flesh means there should be cooperation in the decision making, right? There should be love, there should be respect. It's not a single dimensional decision. If the husband wants to eat chi kueh, the wife wants to eat tai dao kueh, then what do you do? You go to the hawker center, order both, and your kids no choice, got to eat, right? So, both make decisions. And it does determine the outcome of your family. Second illustration. It's election week. The country goes to the polls on Friday. And a whole range of responses to the election, right? On the one hand, I call them the, the pacifists. I you are no need to vote, lah. No point voting. Already decided. Huh? Sure, this party win one. 
I mean, what, what do we say to that kind of response? We say, first of all, voting is compulsory in Singapore, right? Except if you are sick this time round. But every citizen has the capacity and the right and the responsibility to vote. You should take this seriously. And frankly, even if you abstain and you don't vote, you've made a choice. But on the other side, far on the other end, we have who I call the activists. Those who believe my vote is the most important vote, you know. If you don't follow my vote, huh, don't talk to me. Only my vote counts. If you don't vote the way I vote, get along. Now that's extreme, isn't it? It's not just up to you, is it? Well, yeah, you get to vote on your dimension. But for an election for a country, the outcome is determined collectively. And nobody can be absolutely sure ahead of time. So, the decision control paradigm has these two questions. Do I have free will to decide on issue A? Answer, yes. Does that mean no one else can decide on issue A? Answer, no. Elections, for example, are the collective will of all citizens expressed at the ballot box. You are responsible for your vote. You decide which box to cross. You exercise free will. But when all the votes are collected, even if you are not happy, you can't change the outcome. You aren't in control. Why then? Why then should we have difficulty with this concept when we approach the almighty perfect God? Why? It's not difficult to understand, but it's difficult to accept because it means I have to submit. It means I don't get what I want all the time. If by definition God is perfect, and He must be, if not, He would not be God. Just because He gives delegated freedom to make decisions doesn't take away from His sovereignty. It doesn't mean He has lost control. God always retains full and final sovereign control. In the language of decision-making, He decides. That isn't difficult to understand at all. Man is accountable to God. And that's the truth. And that's my second point. On the slides, man is accountable to God. Man exercises free will. We are given capacity to make choices. God has revealed His mercy, and we should respond. Paul points out that the Israelites made a choice. They are free to make choices as individuals and as a people. They have free will. They are accountable for their choice. In chapter 9, verse 30 to chapter 10, verse 21, Paul explains why are not many people in Israel being saved? Answer, because they have stubbornly refused to believe. Look at his explanation. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained the righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, but Israel, which follow after the law of righteousness, have not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith but as it were, by the works of the law. Paul is explaining salvation history. He's saying, let's compare the different responses. And Israel has not quite responded correctly. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone that believes. Israel, as a people, rejected Christ. Christ is the only way of righteousness. And so Romans chapter 10 concludes that physical Israel who rejected Jesus has no excuse. They are accountable for their choice. 
Paul then switches to talk about true Israel. Who is true Israel? People who believe. He explains in Romans chapter 10 that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Oh yes, we make the choice. This is our accountability, our responsibility. We choose to confess Jesus with our mouth and believe him in our heart. This is volitional language. This is language of choice. At this point, some of you are saying, Pastor, you confuse me. Huh? Contradiction. Huh? Does God decide or men decide? Okay, well, this is the single dimension either or model. If you approach this subject with this model, that God has a divine choice, and human beings have divine choice, and the two shall never meet, it's either one or the other, you will say contradiction. Here, however, is the biblical viewpoint. There is a heavenly dimension on which God sovereignly chooses, and a human perspective upon which man exercises free will to respond. You say, Pastor, I can even understand that, okay? But can you explain to me how the heavenly dimension interacts with the human perspective? And that's where, that's where, faith comes into play. You say, why? Because that's beyond me. That's multidimensional. I said before, I can only be one place at one time, right? I don't know your heart. I can only account for what you say. I can't account for what you will become or what you will decide the next minute or the next 10 years. But there's a God who can. He's multidimensional. He can allow a decision to be free will made and yet retain ultimate control. Say, Pastor, how do you do that? If I can tell you, I will be God. The reality is that we live in a different dimension from God. God decides. Do you understand how He decides? You decide. Do you understand how you decide? Well, you should. I hope you, you know the basis of your decisions. You say, Pastor, that blows my mind. Yeah, I know. A multidimensional God should blow your mind. It should. This is a God who exists in perfect dimensional knowledge and power. You know, God made galaxies, right? And we are starting to just discover a few more planets. So the better biblical model is this. God's divine choice functions at His level. Human choice functions at our level. We account for God's sovereignty over man and man's accountability to God. How do we bridge the two? A multi-dimensional perfect God bridges the two dimensions. There is no other explanation. Folks, this doesn't just apply for salvation. This applies for everything in your life. Why are you here? You decided, right? Yes. Did God decide? Yes. Who are you going to marry? Do you decide? Yes. Does God decide? Yes. This is no different from everyday life, brothers and sisters. You account for your choice. You let God account for His. Don't try to be God. Lucifer did. And he fell. We do have a responsibility. We focus on our dimension. We pray for God-given wisdom to make decisions that are right according to His biblical will. We allow God to be God. We recognize and submit. There is so much beyond us. This is intellectual honesty, Christian or not. 
by definition, God is perfect. Otherwise, you're just left with the alternative of the fool. There is no God. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 15 then concludes, what is our responsibility? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. What is this glad tidings of good things? What is this good news? Let's try this. There's been no response for some time. When I say Romans, you say, thank you for replying, even on live stream. Romans is about the gospel. Our obligation is to be beautiful, to bring the good news, the tidings of great joy and peace. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Let's make this intensely practical. You've heard testimonies today from three of our brethren, two of how they evangelize in the context God has given to them. One, about how 65 teachers have been trained from eight churches to capitalize on this very challenging time to be a blessing to our migrant workers and if they are willing to hear the gospel. Let's make this very practical because on the last Sunday of this month, Missions and Evangelism Month, we have a gospel service online. Dr. Mark Lehman from Taiwan will be preaching. And the topic of his message is the just shall live by faith. I believe our social media team has started to create invitations online. Whether it's Facebook, Instagram, I encourage all of us would you be beautiful? Would you seek to communicate the gospel of peace? Second opportunity, this Saturday, an introduction to seeker studies and evangelism tools. I often get this question, hi pastor, my colleague has agreed to do a short Bible study with me, what can I do? <laughs> Have you ever found yourself in such a situation? One of our brothers just found himself in such a situation this year, during the circuit breaker. And by God's grace, his colleague has professed faith in Jesus Christ after engaging in one of the seeker studies. How about children? What tracks do we give them? How do we present the gospel to a child? Come and find out more. Four of our own brethren will be sharing on 11th of July from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Details are found on our PPCC family telegram channel. God is sovereign always. God decides. We have no capacity to judge God because God is perfectly omniscient and fair, and we are not. Man is accountable to God. Man exercises free will. We are given capacity to make choices on the human dimension. God has revealed his righteousness by faith, and we should respond. The implications then are far reaching for our response to the gospel. Firstly, salvation is all of God's mercy and none of human merit. And so we should be humble. We didn't do anything to merit God's salvation. God is perfectly omniscient, merciful and fair. Trust him instead of being intensely suspicious of a perfect God. Finally, man is accountable to ex exercise his choice to respond, choose to believe that is our response to the gospel. We preach the universal call. All who believe have eternal life. Do I know who will believe? No. That is our privilege. Our privilege to the approach of sharing the gospel. That we have a task to share the gospel, but we should be mindful about how we share the gospel. That we don't prejudge the likelihood of salvation. Salvation is not by race. It is all of grace. And so we share the universal invitation to believe. We say, whosoever will come. 
That also means we don't trouble anyone unwilling to hear because there is freedom of will for all, right? On the human dimension. This fits in really well with multicultural, multi-religious Singapore. We will never force anyone who does not wish to listen. We should not because there is free will. God will bring sinners to himself as they respond in belief. And many times some of our people are discouraged. Pastor, I prayed for so long. I prayed for so long. Brothers and sisters, we do our part within our accountability and we leave the rest to God. We sing you are the word of God the Father from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the lands. With a shout, you rose victorious, wresting victory from the grave and ascended into heaven, leading captives in your way. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own, for each tribe and tongue and nation. You are leading sinners home. You are the author of creation. You are the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the lands. This beautiful hymn was sung by our youth advisors last week. It's found on our YouTube channel. It depicts how we acknowledge the sovereignty of God and yet feel His heartbeat to be accountable to respond to a God who is merciful and to bring His cry, a cry of love to people around us and beyond Singapore across the lands. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your sovereignty, without which you could not be God and worthy of our worship. With all of human logic, we reach this conclusion, for otherwise there is no God. We bow in humble submission to the God of all creation, the author of salvation. And we take responsibility for all of the decisions you allow us to have. You have not made us robots. You have given us free will. We are accountable to you for what we decide. How does this cohere? A multi-dimensional perfect God is the only one who can account for all of this. Father, give us grace. Help us to see the reality of your sovereignty and the reality of our accountability. Help us to appreciate that you are not single dimension. You are not like us. And that gives us all the more reason to praise you. You are God alone. We bow in reverent praise to the God of all creation who is in control of all of our days. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.